2007 was an especially exciting year for me. I had just turned 18, and I was excited at the thought of having a say in deciding the kind of leadership I wanted for my country. I woke up on the 27th of December, stood in line for possibly six hours before I got to cast my vote, but I didn't care. I was just excited. A few hours after voting, I was glued to the TV screens because I was eager to get to see the results and get to know what uh, my civic participation had actually um, brought out. The first day passed and results trickled in slowly, but I wasn't phased because I assumed that the Electoral Commission of Kenya had things covered. But when the second day and the third day passed with results trickling in extremely slowly, I got anxious. I knew something was wrong. Results from different media houses were extremely inconsistent. Everybody had their own tally, had their own figures of who was winning and who wasn't winning, which made me think that the media was out there to serve the politicians as opposed to serving the Kenyan population. A few days later, on December 30th, 2007, the results were announced, followed by a hasty swearing-in ceremony, and a dark cloud formed over this country. Violence broke out in different parts of Kenya, and some of the unconfirmed reports that we were all receiving were chilling. The media still wasn't able to tell us what was going on. Our country was literally burning, and they were playing cartoons on live television. Our newly installed government was trying to bury our heads in the sand and tell us that everything was okay, downplaying how severe the situation was. A group of four Kenyan bloggers, Ori Okolo, Juliana Rotich, Eric Hassman, and David Kobia, decided to build a tool that would allow for ordinary Kenyans like myself to share messages of what was happening around them. They built a tool that allowed for ordinary Kenyans to send in messages about human rights violations, deaths, riots, effectively giving them a voice where no one else could or would. They built Ushahidi. Ushahidi is an open source platform that allows for ordinary citizens to collect meaningful data, get the real-time pulse, respond to issues, and most importantly, to tell their stories. It allows for collection of data via SMS, email, Twitter, the web platform, as well as smartphone applications. This tool is named after a Swahili word that means testimony. This tool catalyzed a paradigm shift in how information flows in the world. It gave rise to the notion that people can speak up and can be heard. It gave people an opportunity to raise their voices. After the initial map, a lot of people across the world started reaching out to the Ushahidi team to use the platform as a way of including, having people included in conversations as opposed to being excluded in matters affecting their lives. From crisis response to human rights mapping, from election monitoring to citizen journalism, and even environmental mapping. This tool was being used across the entire world to raise the voices of people who are considered to be passive recipients of information. Now, during the Russian fires of 2010, the platform was used not as a way of mapping out the fires themselves, but as a way of connecting citizens who are in need with the resources they require. When disasters tend to hit, it's very hard for those who are in need to get the help that they need. An earthquake hit Haiti in January of 2010, causing massive infrastructural damage, which meant that humanitarian responders were not able to get to those who needed the help in time, or were not able to figure out what they needed. A group of volunteers who now go by the name Standby Task Force came together to deploy the platform as a means of connecting people in need with the people who can help them. Messages would come in via SMS into the platform, they would translate it from Creole into English and push that over to humanitarian responders. Ushahidi was revolutionizing the concept of crisis response. This was the first time that humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross were able to communicate in a real-time fashion with people on the ground and get them the resources that they needed. This story isn't quite different from what happened earlier this year as well. 
On April 25, 2015, a massive earthquake hit the people of Nepal, causing destruction of a lot of property, many people were killed, and tens of thousands injured. A group of people working for Kathmandu Living Labs and volunteering with another group called Nepal Monitor decided to deploy Shahidi one more time as a means of coordinating response and making sure that there were no assumptions being made around what people needed, as opposed to sending out blankets when people need food, making sure that there was a clear, a clear communication line between the ordinary citizens and the people who needed help from them. They were able to collect more than 2,000 reports and create action out of one out of every three reports that were coming in. They were able to transform collection of data into meaningful action to create impact in their communities. Let's move on to another different use case. During the Egyptian revolution, Ushahidi played an important role in documenting the elections, documenting the January 25th uh, revolution, and also documenting the constitutional amendments. The group of people who deployed Ushahidi in Egypt were well aware that the map would have been taken down, but they didn't care because they wanted to show the world what was happening on the ground. And similarly in Libya, the Standby Task Force as well as UN OCHA deployed the platform once again as a means of providing a better situational awareness of what exactly was happening on the ground. This is one of my favorite examples of the use of Ushahidi because it's something that touches very closely to my own heart as a woman. The founders of Harassmap were tired of being hounded on the streets of Egypt. You know, you walk around and people are harassing you all the time and you're unable to speak up because you feel like speaking up will not make a difference because society has accepted it as a status quo. They decided to deploy Ushahidi as a means of not only creating awareness about sexual harassment against women, but also changing the conversation so that we're getting to the point where we're creating some sort of behavioral change, getting people to know about how deeply rooted this issue is in our countries and how it's affecting the lives of women and trying to reset the relationship between women and men in Egypt. They've done a lot of studies and have conducted a lot of community uh, working groups and sessions to try and also change the mindset of the men who are actually perpetrating this and trying to make sure that people understand that sexual harassment is something that we should not accept. Now, because of our history, elections in general, and Kenyan elections in particular, are something that are very important to the team at Ushahidi. If there's one group of people who should hate elections, it's Kenyans. <laughs> Because during elections, you lose property, you lose friendships, and sadly, people lose their lives. You would think that, we'd, we would think that Kenyans hate politics by now, but we don't. We relish it. And because we love politics and we love elections, let's try and have good ones. So in 2013, once again, Ushahidi deployed a modified version of the platform and named it Uchaguzi, which is a Swahili word for elections. But this time, it was a little different. As opposed to a reactionary response to something that was going on, we decided that we were going to use it as a preventive measure to make sure that what happened in 2007 never happens again. Our strategy was to tap into the collective intelligence of the crowd to collect data and help every Kenyan protect their vote. Once we collected that data, we were able to verify it. And after that, escalated to people who would be able to do something about it. Whether it's I walked into my polling station and it wasn't opened on time, for that over to the IEBC, or there's a group of people collecting with pangas near polling station, for that over to law enforcement agencies so that they're able to do something about it. We were able to see more than 5,000 messages received, about 90% of these being largely from SMS, across this entire country. I think we actually did a lot to help Kenyans protect their vote. Now, these are really, really powerful examples of how Ushahidi is being used to escalate or amplify the voices of people who are passive recipient, considered to be passive recipients of information. There are 90,000 maps out there right now, actually more than 90,000 maps. 
uh, this platform has been deployed in more than 150 countries and translated into more than 50 languages. I think that all these maps have one thing in common. These maps have capitalized on one theory, that it takes something that, that affects you directly to make you think about acting and solving a problem in your community. So let me try and explain this a little further. Let's assume that there's a pothole in your community, and every day you're driving past it, it, it scratches the underground, it, it scratches the body of your car. Or better yet, since Kenya is a walking nation, um, every time you're walking by a street uh, with El Nino coming along, if the, uh, the pothole is filled with water, every time a car passes by, water is splashed on you. Or better yet, every time you're sitting in that matatu going to work or going wherever you're going, every time it goes over that bump, you hit your head. When the local government decides to fix this pothole, that really is news. It's something that you get really excited about. News about a pothole being fixed in Uganda really, it doesn't affect you much. It's not something that touches you close to your heart. The common factor between all these different maps is the fact that they were able to identify issues that people on the ground really care about, and they've been able to collect so much data and create meaningful impact in their communities through that. Now, um, our incoming executive director at Ushahidi, Dawood Diwera, once told me that Technology can be more powerful than throwing stones, more radical than throwing stones. And that's true. True testament to that is looking at the number of maps we've seen um, being deployed for Ushahidi. But there's one disclaimer. It's not just about the technology. Technology contributes to just about 10% of the success of any initiative. Without the human interaction, without the planning behind it, technology is mute. So we always need to think about the other 90%. Look at technology not as a complete solution to your problem, problem my apologies, but something that amplifies your, your solution. Which brings me to the next point. Insight from data can be used to leapfrog, right? Data can be used to drive a lot of decisions in our countries, in our homes, to help us make better decisions. However, we should always look at I'll use this analogy of a farm. The data, uh, data are seeds. Platforms like Ushahidi exist to help you understand, to help, you help create access to information, to help make the data ingestible. You know, if I was to give you a spreadsheet right now with a lot of numbers on it, it'll seem boring. But you being able to log on and look at it on a map or visualize it, it really helps you make sense out of what exactly is being said. But all of that, the data and the platforms, are meaningless without people. We need to tap into the intelligence of local people. I know that in this world, we always tend to think about people as uneducated in some sense and assume that we are the ones who know everything that's going on and don't pay attention to the context. The local people have that context. Let's capitalize on their knowledge. And finally, a society that gives people a second chance is a fantastic society. In, two <laughs> Late 2007 was a very dark time for Kenyans. It was a very dark time in Kenyan history. 2008 was a second chance for Kenya. Looking at a tool that was built out of problems you always tend to associate with Africa, low bandwidth, bad governance, and seeing the kind of impact it was creating across the entire world. The map you're seeing behind here, all those dots on the map represent a single post shared by a voice that would have otherwise been silent. I think that's extremely powerful, and we should be extremely proud of our country. Thank you.